uh, deal with something this morning. Since we're on the subject of love, we had a question come in that fits hand in glove with what we're talking about, and I've been kind of just sitting on it, waiting to deal with it. So this morning, we're going to deal with it. And here was the question that came in from an online viewer. Why do we hate the LGBTQ2 people? <clears throat> it's, it's like, okay, well, we're going to have to communicate about that a little bit, talk about that a little bit. Um, so the, the question that went back was, why do you feel we do hate them? And the answer that came back was, we speak so negatively about the movement. Okay, so let's answer this question. So to begin with, let me just state right from the beginning. Our goal is to not hate anybody. That's right. it, if they're a human being, we're commanded to love them. Right. So our goal is not to hate them. So we are commanded to love everybody, and it's our effort to do that, and sometimes we don't succeed as well as others, but we're trying. Here is what I hear in that question, and it's something that's common in our culture. We mix the value of the person with their behavior. That's right. That is a cultural thing that we cannot do, but in America we do it. You broke that, I mean, even from little, you broke that, you're a bad girl. No, no, no. Don't take the behavior and judge the value of the person. They are not a bad person because they made a mistake. Or you did this, good boy. So now all of a sudden they have value and worth because they did something right in our eyes. And if they do something wrong in our eyes, they have no value or worth. See, that is common in our culture. So when we say we don't agree with a certain behavior, it automatically can be assumed we don't like them. (coughs) You are not your behavior. God set the precedent on that. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved everyone. God loves everyone. And in Romans it says, even when we were still sinners, God loved us enough that Christ came to die for us. What did he die for? The sin. So we could be free of it. Because he loves the people. So when it says God loves the world, it doesn't mean he loves the sin. He loves the people. He separates us from our choices and our behaviors and absolutely gave everything for us to get us free from that. Because if you want to just put, you know, sin, and and there'll be some we'll look at here in a bit. If you want to put it in a category... Sin is what steals, kills, and destroys. So anything in the human race that is killing and destroying us, God hates. He doesn't hate the people who are doing those things. He hates the things that is destroying them. We have to separate those two. Jesus died to save the people from the sin he didn't die to make the sin okay the sin will be destroyed the person will be saved so you have to separate the behavior from from the worth of the person and if we confuse those two then anytime we don't agree on something well you just don't like me that really has nothing to do with you. It's the issue we're talking about. It's the issue we're looking at. We love the people, we're against the sin. Another thing that we have confused in our society, and it's becoming more confused with the extreme tolerance that's being taught and so forth, 
is, if you love me, you will condone what I'm doing and agree with me. Because if you love me, just let me live my life. Your life is killing you. And the fact I love you is why I'll bring it up. See, if, you're, if, you're gonna, if that thinking is correct, you need to drive it through every facet of life. If you love your child, just let them do what they want to do. If they want to put their hand on the hot burner on the stove, you love them. Let them do it. Oh, no, I would never. Why? You love them. So if the philosophy of if you love them, let them do what they want to do, approve of it, agree with it, is correct, then you need to press that through everything. If you love your child and they don't want to go to school as a junior higher or high schooler, why make them? I mean, we love you. We wouldn't want to put you in an uncomfortable situation. See, it doesn't, it doesn't work in, in life. So if it doesn't work in life, it doesn't work in this application either. God loves us enough to say no to us. You're killing yourself. Stop it. Oh, you're judging me. No, I'm actually loving you. Now, we can say it the wrong way, but the purpose should be love. So this is the big question that comes up before we actually make our scriptural point. Pastor, aren't we supposed to love everybody as Christians? I mean, as Christians, we should be the first ones who love. Absolutely. But I made a couple points already. Just because I love you doesn't mean I have to agree with you. You say, how do you know that? God loves everybody. God loves Satan. But God doesn't agree with them. Don't confuse love and agreement. Well, we're Christians. We're supposed to love them. Yes, I agree with that. But the thought of I'm supposed to agree with their choices and their behavior because I'm a Christian, no, that is a society-produced thing. Now, how we express that love, that's why we're doing this study. And we'll talk about that in message number two here in a bit. Let's get through this one first. But the study of love. We don't always express it right. We don't always show it right. And sometimes we need to stop and reevaluate ourselves. But, <clears throat> yes, as Christians, we're supposed to love whoever walks the face of this earth. But, and I, I've, I've heard this numerous times, Well, I have the right to love anybody. If I'm a woman, I have the right to love a woman. If I am a man, I have the right to love a man. If, you know, however you want to apply that. And I say, absolutely. But loving someone and having sex with them are two different things. That's right. Amen. Amen. That is right. We absolutely not only have the right to love, we're commanded to love right. everybody. But loving someone and having sex with them are two different things. And again, our society has messed that one up. I mean, for decades, since I've been little, people make love. You can't make love. Love comes from God. And it's given to us. It's shed abroad. You can't make it by having sex. You know, <laughs> my speech teacher told me, if you give a speech on that subject, you will get nowhere. I said, I know, but I feel I'm supposed to do it. She said, oh, I'm warning you, because we were doing, I had, we had speech class, and uh, we had gotten through district level, and we were to regional level, and if we got through regional level, we were going to state. And she said, you've got the capability, you can go to state with speeches. But I picked what is love. She said, you can't pick that topic. I said, why? She said, because there's going to be judges who disagree with you, and they'll, they'll throw you out right there. So then they're not judging me on how well I'm giving a speech. They're judging me on their own personal preference of my content. So I made that statement. I, mean, I said it this way. I said... If it's possible to make love by having sex, then since God is love, 
we're actually making some form of God through the sexual act. And this one judge lady who was kind of involved at that point went like this and turned away and I said, well, there goes state. You know, that's, that's over right now. Uh, that's an interesting concept. <laughs> yeah, it is. But the whole thing of love and how it's been twisted in America is messed up. Do I agree we need to love everybody? Yes. Do I think we should have sex with everybody? No. <laughs> Do I think we should agree with everybody? No. Um, and, and all I'm doing is following God's example to us. You know, it's, all, it's a very simple picture to see. But he did address it in Scripture, and I want to go there and talk about this a bit. So we're going to go to Romans chapter 1. And it's a, it's a big subject, so I, I have to take a few minutes on this. It's not a five-minute, I'm going to answer this. Whatever time we have left over, we'll go to our second message. But we have to deal with this <clears throat> because we absolutely do not work. Let me back up on how I say that. We're absolutely not supposed to hate anyone. Now, as Christians, we're growing, and sometimes we haven't gotten there yet, but we're supposed to love everyone. Everyone. We're supposed to follow the Father's example, love everyone. So Romans chapter 1, God addresses this. He says, I, verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. That's very important considering what he's going to deal with next. The gospel is the power of salvation to get people out of the bondage, out of the thing that will eventually destroy them. Verse 17, for in the righteousness of God is revealed, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, the just shall live by faith. So he's talking about salvation, getting free, living by faith. And now he enters his subject he's going to deal with. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Please make note of that verse. That's why we take a stand on things because I don't want to end up on the wrath of God's side. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against LGBTQ. No all ungodliness so no matter what the issue is we might we might have a theft problem we might have a lying problem we we might have a gossiping problem it, it makes no difference it will destroy and hurt people that's why it's called sin and that's why god hates it because he doesn't want people destroyed and hurt so his wrath is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. And do sometimes Christians, do sometimes churches make excuses for bad behavior because we're running a good old boys club? Yes. Is it right? No. Should it change? Yes. There's nothing that should be acceptable if it's in the it's hurting people realm because it's not acceptable to God. So anything that smells like ungodliness and unrighteousness, eventually the wrath of God is going gonna, is gonna to hit it. And anybody who suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. So in other words, I'm doing something ungodly or unrighteous. I'm treating my wife badly. God doesn't want that. Treating my husband badly. God doesn't want that. But at our church, women know their place. Shut up, be quiet, do nothing except the janitorial and take care of the kids. Anything important is men's work. Now that doesn't happen here. So you can all sit down now and don't charge me at once. But that is in churches. Okay? The wrath of God is going to be revealed against those people because they're suppressing the truth. 
by wanting to stay in unrighteousness. Okay, I don't want that wrath of God on me. So let's read on. Verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. So we know right from wrong because God has shown it. You say how? Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. So way deep down in our heart, we know. It, it's been shown to us. We've seen it. Um, it. It's not a big mystery. Verse 21. Because although they knew God. See, now here's the problem. We're dealing with a culture here in Romans 1 or a society where people at one time knew God. But they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful to him as God should be thanked for what he provides for us. But, be they, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So rather than choosing to take the right route in their approach with God, they took a, an empty, worthless, a futile route in their thinking, and their heart became darkened because of it. This became known as wisdom, verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God... Now, this is a culture way back past Paul's time, so this is old. This is how they did it back there. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So they started worshiping idols, animals, etc. That's how they did it back there. They didn't have TVs and they didn't have smartphones and they didn't have other things to worship, so they did it that way. You say, why would they do that? Because their heart was darkened. Because they chose the wrong attitude towards God. Rather than glorifying him and acknowledge him, acknowledging him as their source and so forth, being thankful, verse 21, they had a better wisdom and it darkened their heart and they went into stupid things, worshiping animals and idols. Verse 24, here's where we're going to switch to the Amplified because it, it makes these next few verses much cleaner. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their own hearts to sexual impurity. Notice what was mixed in with why they switched to idols and animals. God gave them up to something they already wanted. This isn't new. They wanted this. Chances are really good what they wanted, they knew God wasn't in favor of. So therefore, we're not going to glorify God. We're not going to thank him. We have a wisdom beyond this archaic stuff that we've been taught. We have a knowledge now that, I mean, and this is over 2,000 years ago. Does it sound familiar? You know, this whole Christianity thing, I mean, that, that's archaic. That's dinosaur stuff. We have wisdom now that, that you guys don't have. And it's okay to do certain things that, you know, I, it's just, I don't know what's wrong. You, you don't love or something. There's something wrong with you. See, that same thinking was back there. So they turned from God to a different thing that they gave their allegiance, their worship to, and God said, okay, since you want this anyway, I'll give you up to the sexual impurity, the lusts of your heart, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, abandoning them to the degrading power of sin. Hmm. wonder what that means. Well, let's go on. Verse 25. Because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature. See, there's idol worship or animal worship rather than the creator who is blessed forever. For instance, when the children of Israel, when Moses was on the mountain, the children of Israel thought he died. He didn't come down. They wanted a God to lead them. So they took the gold and fashioned a God to look like what? A calf. Animal worship. Seriously. A calf? You didn't grow up on a farm. If you're going to start living your life by what calves have for wisdom, 
you're in deep trouble. But that's what he's talking about. You know, they, they don't want what God has to offer, so we're going to go into a different direction, and we're going to call calf worship wisdom. Okay. Verse 26. So we already know a hidden motive of what they wanted here, what they really wanted to get into was sexual immorality. And God wasn't allowing it, so they switched from that God to a, a smarter one, an animal. You say, why would they do that? Well, stop and think about it. Animals have sex with anything that moves. I mean, get into their head. We're talking about sexual immorality is what they wanted. You name the animal. When it's the season, the bull doesn't say to the cow that he just had relations with, I'm committed to you. That cow's history. We're into a new day. That's why you only need one bull for 30, 35 cows or more. Okay? So why would they worship? You go back to the story in the children of Israel. I dealt with that when I was talking about my list and, and their naked, drunken orgy where they were dancing and so forth. Remember that? Animals look on that kind of thing with favor. Just saying. So, verse 26, for this reason, what reason? They're getting stupid. They want their way. They're worshiping animals. They're worshiping idols as being the wise ones to lead them. God says, if you want your way, I'll let you have your way. I mean, I'm not forcing you to do anything here. For this reason, God, again, it says, gave them over. They wanted it. He just said, okay, go ahead. And abandoned them to vile affections and degrading passions. He's got to be talking sexual stuff because that's what he said in verse 24. Well, he goes on and explains it. Their women exchanged their natural function for an unnatural and abnormal one. Well, what does that mean? Well, he gives us a hint because remember in the, in the original... In the original manuscripts, there's no verses or periods or commas. It's just one big, long thought. So take verse 27 out and just read it. For their women exchanged their natural function in a natural, for an unnatural and abnormal one, and the men also turned from natural relations. So the women did it and the men did it, and now he's going to explain what the men did so we'll understand what the women did. And the men also turned from natural relations with women and were set ablaze, burning out, consumed with lust for one another. Men committing shameful acts with men. Oh, here we go. So women weren't going for men. Women were going for women. And men weren't going for women. Men were going for men. Huh committing shameful acts with men and suffering in their own bodies and personalities. Isn't that interesting? It messes with the body and it messes with the personality. And that's a whole study you can do online uh, that I won't get into here. But isn't it interesting? The scripture brought it up thousands of years ago. Suffering in their own bodies and person personalities, the inevitable consequences and penalty for their wrongdoing and going astray. See, remember, this culture chose it. They knew God. They knew what God wanted. They wanted to do their own thing. So they turned and went their own direction. And as a result now, their wrong choices, their, their going astray, there's problems. Which was their fitting retribution. Which makes me go, well, evidently they knew, you know, you, you go this direction, this is going to turn out badly. So God's saying, well, told you. You didn't listen. 
verse 28. And so since they did not see fit to acknowledge God or approve of him or consider him worth knowing, God gave them over to base and condemned mind to do things not proper or decent, but loathsome. So we try something and then it's not satisfying. So we try more and it's not satisfying. And you know how it goes. You just you go deeper to try to get that, that rush, to try to get that satisfaction. This is what God calls it. A base or very low condemned mind and what you're doing is not proper, it's not decent, it's loathsome. I despise it, I loathe it. This, this, is, this is what God thinks of it. So he said, you want it, there you go, have it. I, I'm not going to tell you, you can't do it, go ahead. It's just not good. Verse 29, until they were filled, permeated, and saturated with every kind of unrighteousness. Well, now this is an interesting thought. They wanted the sexual immorality, the homosexuality, the, the gay, the everything that we put the LGBTQ to. He just described that. They wanted that. When he gave that to them and said, fine, you want to serve some four-footed calf for your God and run around and do what you're going to do? Have at it. He gave them over to it. Out of that came every kind of unrighteousness. Iniquity, grasping and covetous greed and malice. They were full of envy and jealousy, murder, strife, deceit, treachery, ill will and cruel ways. They were secret backbiters and gossipers, slanders, hateful to God and hating God, full of insolence, arrogance and boasting, inventors of new forms of evil, disobedient and undutiful to parents. Every form of evil started coming in this culture, in this society, after God gave them over. So now let me make a really good point here. Why, the question was, why do we hate the LGBTQ2? We don't. Well, you pick on them. Back up to verse 29. If someone is greedy, do we hate them? If they're struggling with jealousy and envy, do we hate them? Someone is filled with strife, murder. They, they're deceiving. They're lying. Do we hate them? No. Go to the next verse. They're slanderers. They're saying stuff about people that is wrong, and they're trying to malign the reputation. They're even hateful to God. Oh, you hate God? I hate you. Do we do that? We shouldn't. They're arrogant and boastful. We don't hate arrogant people. We'd be hating some of us. We're still working on some of that. Right? right? That's true. Children who are disobedient to parents. We hate you. No, we don't. <laughs> so why is the question asked when right from the beginning God said his wrath is being poured out against all all unrighteousness and he lists a whole bunch of stuff why does the question even come up well you hate this one group no we don't we try to love everybody but you know what being disobedient to parents is wrong and we'll talk about it being uh, arrogant is wrong we'll talk about it gossiping or backbiting or slander is wrong we'll talk about it we're not talking about it because we hate the people. We're talking about it because the thing has to be addressed. Yep. Amen. Verse 31. Well, let me say, let me add this. The reason the thing has to be addressed is because it will destroy and kill relationships. It will destroy people's uh, ability to function in society. It, it just it messes people up. The destruction element is what God calls sin. 
That is what he is going to destroy in the end. He's going to put an end to the destructive element. He loves the people. That's our example. We're trying to take a stand on the destructive element. We love the people. So now, if we bring the destructive element up and talk about it, that applies to all of us. If it's lying, if it's slander, if it's pride, if it, it, that applies to all of us. And we're not just picking out one or two people and saying, you proud, arrogant thing, look at all of us righteous people, and you're a stain on this body. You know, that, that's what the Pharisees and Sadducees did. That's not love. These things apply to all of us. You say, why? Because the wrath of God is going to come against these things, and it'd be good not to be on that side of the fence when she all comes down. So out of love, let's try to encourage everybody to get across the fence to the other side. Verse 31, they were without understanding. So he's talking about this culture. They were without understanding, conscienceless and faithless, heartless, loveless, and merciless. Wow. That's God's opinion on it. They, though they are fully aware of God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve to die or deserve death. The wages of sin is death. Sin always destroys. So he's talking about all these things that came out of an attitude of I want to have sex with anybody I want to have sex with. It's not about I want to love anybody I want to love. You're free to love anybody you can love. It's the sexual immorality part that God says, no, no, we can't do that. So out of that comes all these other things that were listed. They, they just mushroomed and grew in that atmosphere. Though they are fully aware of God's righteous decree. So they knew. They knew God. They just chose a different route. That those who do such things deserve to die. They not only do them themselves, but they approve and applaud others who practice them. See, I can't. You, you might have a lying problem, and I can love you. But I can't applaud and say, wow, you, you really pulled it over on your boss that time. Good job. I, I, I can't applaud that. Because what you did was wrong. You, you might have a theft problem. I, I was friends when my first pastor, and I was friends with a, a guy who owned a company, had 400 and almost 50 employees, uh, just a huge company. And he got sharing with me one day. <clears throat> he said, you can't believe the amount of stuff that walks out of our business that we just keep ordering new stuff and replacing it it doesn't even try to pay try to figure out who stole it he said it's thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a month that people just help themselves got a drill here got a saw here got whatever here and this that and the other and they just take it and go on with it what did you get you got that out oh Good job. Now you don't have to buy it. I mean, that company's rich anyway. They don't need it. We can't applaud that and say we approve. That comes from a depraved mind. We have to say, no, you, you really should take that back. It's not yours. You stole it. Or you really need to go back and correct what you lied about. That's the goal. And as we're all reaching for the goal, we love everybody. But that's the goal in all areas of life. Uh, Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 talks about homosexuality and how that people who are, are in that lifestyle are not going to inherit the kingdom of God and so forth. So... At some point, you have to take a stand on what's right and what's wrong. 
That doesn't mean we hate you because we disagree with you, or it doesn't mean I hate you because I disagree with you. It means there's a standard that God has set that we're all trying to measure ourselves against and become more like. That's all we're doing. So separate the value of the person from the behavior or the choice. They're two different things. God gave his son for the person. He has absolutely no esteem for sin whatsoever. He will destroy it, bring it to an end, and it will be over. Separate those two. You are not your behavior. You are not your choices. You are a human being made in the image of God who is loved deeply by God, and we're growing in that. Your choices, however, might really stink. And if I love you, and I have enough of a relationship with you about it, I can talk to you, because if your choices stink, eventually they're going to destroy you. That's why the Holy Spirit talks to us about our choices. You're doing something wrong. If you loved me, you just let me alone. Don't say anything. No, he gets in our face and says, knock that off. Why? Because our choices are going to destroy us. So hopefully that answers that question. I know it took a long time to deal with it, but I had to. That's one of those questions that you just don't, uh, hey, let's give a two-minute answer here and really confuse or stir the pot.